All right, Pastor Fred, let's right. do this thing. Hey, right. it's going to be fun today. I want to talk to you about in this first week of FOMO a topic that can be awkward. It can't be one of those church conversations that feels heavy-handed or weird sometimes. I want that not to be the case. The topic is, is it's money. It's money. It's, it's, it's resource. Thank you, one happy person. <laughs> uh, it's most specifically generosity. Now, the Bible has a very pervasive economic ethic. It talks about everything we need to do with money, you know, how, how to spend money, invest money, save money, how to manage debt. Um, all those things are dealt with in the Scripture in some detail. But generosity is the one that, you know, an audience like this might feel weird about or the conversation is somehow inherently awkward when the preacher brings up, brings up money. But I would just listen, if you're a guest, you know, hang in here. If you're here first time or surely not a Christian at Church by the Glades, at any of our campuses, just don't tune me out. I, I really want this not to be awkward. I'm not going to put you on the spot. We're not going to ask you to give anything to Church by the Glades. In fact, we're not going to pass a plate. We almost never pass a plate. We won't do one any time in the month of February. So don't worry. There won't be that pressure. But I want to show you that this does not have to be an awkward conversation. In fact, if you think about it, if it's presented, I think, properly, it's, it's appropriate and needful. Even it's a logical thing. Yeah. It's a logical thing for people of faith to talk about. So I want to talk about it. But again, this is not going to be one of those high pressure, like, hey, give to the church kind of things. Because we've all been there. In fact, I, I'm a Christian person. I remember back in uh, grad school studying to be a pastor. I was new to town, Fort Worth, Texas. And I was looking for a church, so I was, you know, church shopping, whatever you want to call it, checking out churches. There's a great church on the south side of town, and I walked in as a guest, first time in the building, and I walked in the room, and the only thing they gave me was an offering envelope, not even a handshake, offering envelope, and I found a seat, and it was, it was that Sunday. It was that Sunday that uh, they had like a guest speaker in and they've been having a campaign to renovate the buildings or something and they've been talking about this for like a month but I'm like I'm a new guy and the sermon was really it was it was pressurized and there was a moment the speaker had everyone in the room stand up and said find that offering envelope I lost mine like where's my offering envelope I don't know right. okay hold it up to heaven repeat after me God we're gonna give our ultimate I'm like I don't even know what to do right now do I sit here and look disrespectful? Or do I stand up and lie because I'm not, I'm not doing this? And it was so awkward. I made myself a promise. If God ever trusted me to love and lead a church, I would never do that to our church. I, I, look, I, I'm going to just tell you the truth. I think it's a logical truth about the power of generosity. And then, then it's on you. It's not my job to make you feel pressure. That's the Holy Spirit's job to make you feel pressure. So, so um, just relax. I, I want to have a logical conversation. If you're like your guest, go, oh, my gosh, uh, it's that kind of church. They're always talking about money. No, typically I talk about money or finances one or two weekends a year. Yeah, you hit that week. Sorry about that. <laughs> Come back next week, different topic. Come back for Stephen. But again, I want to show you, how it's a logical thing. So find your Bibles, and this idea is throughout the Scripture. Find Matthew. Find Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Hey, at all our campuses, let's say a text together loudly. Matthew chapter 6. There you go. You had an extra hour of sleep, didn't you? You're in good voice. Matthew chapter 6. I'll be there in a moment. So why is it logical to be a generous person? Because, you know, as a Christian person, as a person of faith, I think I should be habitually generous. Why does that make sense? Well, it might make sense for this reason, that if you've been around the church, you know we are not casual about the resources that you entrust to us. We're very intentional. We try to use those resources to make a positive change in the world. So we take some of the resources you give to us, and we do amazing things here in this city and, uh, man, across the world. Like, you know, we sponsor financially multiple orphanages in different countries, in Haiti, in Nicaragua. We do a thing called baby rescue in remote Guatemala where children are dying due to malnutrition. The infant mortality rates are very high. And we have a clinic we sponsor, and these parents can bring their kids, and sometimes the kids stay there for months because they're in such bad shape. So you're saving literally the lives of children in other places. We, um, gosh, uh, we have remarkable campuses and prisons. What's up, Dade CI Homestead? We're bringing hope to uh, the prisons of Dade County. You resource that. Uh, right here in this city, uh, here in Broward and Palm Beach, we have this remarkable ministry to students right here for our kids. Middle school or high school is called The Wave. We do a great camp in the summer every week on this campus Wednesday night. As a parent, this was huge for me. Yeah. I got smart, cool people on this team 
the part with me in parenting, help my kids navigate these, these treacherous years called the teenage years. So you, I could go on forever. Uh, this month, uh, feed the city. We will feed 10,000 people together. That's, that's huge. So, you know, that, that's a reason to be generous, but it's, it's not the best reason. Doing worthy things, that's the reason that you financially support perhaps a not-for-profit or a charity, but the church is different. For people, faith is different because the main reason we're generous is because it is taught thoroughly throughout the Scripture. A plethora of passages, Old Testament and New Testament. So I'm not going to just cherry-pick a verse here and there. I want you to this theme of God's people being highly generous is something throughout the scripture, throughout the generations that we're called, no matter how you're wired naturally, to practice generosity. And the reason I gotta teach on this logically, some of the coolest promises in the Bible of God's willingness to bless us, to get all involved in your life in beautiful, powerful, divine, supernatural ways are attached to the faith action step of releasing resources into the kingdom. So I want to show you some of these great promises. I wish I had more time. You stay in uh, uh, um, um, Matthew chapter 6. There you go. I'll get there in just a moment. Let me show you a New Testament promise. Let me take you to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 through verse 8. And I've left out a little bit of this. I've left out one of the verses in the middle. But if I have time, I'll circle back around. But I have not violated the context of this promise and this command. It says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but whoever sows generously, get ready, will also reap generously. Look at verse eight, verse eight, I'll skip verse seven. And God is able to bless you abundantly. That, that's so good. Can we just back up and read those three words again? And God is able to If there's any pushback or resistance, just, again, I'm just sharing with you what's in the Bible, what is God's word, and these are God promises. So don't answer out loud. Don't answer out loud, but can you trust God? And and look, he unpacks it, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need. In fact, drop down to verse 11. Verse 11, I don't even know what to do verse 11. Verse 11 is remarkable. It says in verse 11 on the screen, boom, right now, you will be enriched in every way. I, I think God's saying, don't just limit, limit to the financial thing. This is not some like single dimensional financial thing. This is a whole life principle. Right. I would like to enrich your life, you know, relationally, habitually, maybe financially as well. But God has making you a promise, but it begins as we sow with generosity. So throughout the Bible, you find things like this. So today, my goal is to give you a brief theology a doctrine of generosity, kind of a brief survey of this idea in the Bible. So let me show you maybe the most important verse on this. This one is huge, and this verse has nothing to do with money. Well, maybe money is part of it, but it's a a big life principle. Matthew chapter 6, go to chapter 6. It's the Sermon on the Mount, greatest sermon of all time. Speaker is Jesus. So ratchet up the credibility as high as it can go. Look what Jesus says. You You want to maximize this one shot at life do this. It's on the screen right now, 633, Matthew's Gospel. But seek, that's good, but seek first his kingdom. And by the way, it's not really like that in the original text. I just emphasize the first syllable to make a point. The Bible does not describe God's uh, system as a democracy, a republic. It is a kingdom. Why is it a kingdom? Because Jesus is a king. He's not an average run-of-the-mill king. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the king of the world, the king of the universe. The verse continues, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things, these things you worry about and you stress over, he will take care of. He will add or supply unto you. That's the promise he makes. I'll take care of your stuff. But in your life, in every area, put me first. Now, why is that logical? He's a king. See, if he truly is the king of kings, if God is a great king, if Jesus is a great king, this great king deserves my first and my finest. If he truly is, logical progression there, a great king, he deserves my first and my finest. If Jesus is a great king, he deserves my first and my 
finest. If Jesus is a great king, he deserves my first and my finest. Everyone complete that statement. If Jesus is a great king, he deserves my first and my Just makes sense, right? So how about when it comes to part of my life, part of my priorities, money stuff, what I do with money, okay? If you're a Matthew, turn back one book towards the front of your Bible. So Matthew is like the first book in the New Testament. Go to the last book in the Old Testament. So turn to the left one book and you'll hit the, uh, you'll hit the book of Malachi. Turn to Malachi, if you will. Malachi <laughs> chapter, some of y'all laugh at Malachi. Turn to Malachi. He's the only Italian prophet in the Bible. Malachi, cha- okay, it's, I think it's pronounced Malachi. Go to Malachi chapter 3, and I'm not sure what kind of communication style or preaching style you enjoy. Uh, I, I try, if you're a guest, I try to stay, you know, uh, positive. I tell you the truth, but I tell you the truth in love. Man, we teach the scripture here, but I try to do it in a non judgmental way. I just share the truth, and then it's you and God working it out from there. Uh, so maybe you like that. You like that kind of positive vibe in a communicator. Uh, maybe you like it even more. Maybe you like, I don't know, Joel Osteen, yeah, you like someone who smiles the whole time they teach. It's great, right? Okay, uh, Malachi is on the opposite side of the spectrum from Joel, right? He's, he's, he's that up-in-your-grill kind of preacher. Says things kind of strong and harshly to make sure you get it. Look what he says about giving. He's speaking right here for God. Malachi 3, verse 8 and 9 is on the screen right now at every campus. Will a mere mortal rob God? Rob God? How do you, how do you mug the most high God? How, how do you... How do you what? Will a mere mortal or person rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how are we robbing you in tithes and offerings? Okay, give me a theology of generosity. What is a tithe? What is an offering? Let me just break this down technically. A tithe, well, a tithe is taken from the Aramaic or Hebrew, which simply means a tenth. So God says a tenth. A tithe is a tenth. Okay, David said, what's an offering? Because as a punk kid, I went to church a few times. They gave me an offering envelope, and I put my quarter in that. It wasn't a tenth, it was just like, I thought that was, okay, technically speaking, I'm breaking this down, this kind of technical stuff here, an offering is giving over and above 10%. And so, but God here, like, oh my gosh, God's like strong, man, you're robbing me because you're keeping the tithe. What's up with that? Well, in Leviticus 2730, the Bible teaches the tithe, the first tenth, is holy unto the Lord. God says the tithe is mine. Out of everything you have, the first 10% goes to me. And, and if you don't honor me in that, you're literally robbing me. In fact, look at this. Verse 9, you're under a curse, the whole nation, you, because you're robbing me. Okay, David, this is harsh. I thought you said this was not going to be tense or judgmental. No, 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 no. Let's run to the next verse because one of those epic promises of God. And by the promises of God to bless us, when it comes to this subject, are, are some of the boldest, biggest, most audacious, lavish promises in all the Bible. Conversely, if you choose to honor me in this, look at this. Bring the whole tithe. By the way, he doesn't say give. Please donate the tithe. No, no, no. He says bring because in Leviticus he says it's mine. If something is yours, you use language like that. Like if I forgot my Bible before the message began, if I, I'd say to the, the nice tech people, hey, would you guys please bring me my Bible? I wouldn't say, would you please donate my Bible? Because it's my Bible. So the language here is a little strong, but God, it's his possession. The tithe is holy to the Lord. All right, here we go, here we go. Relax, relax, here comes the promise. (laughs) Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. It's the temple storehouse. Other translations actually say to the temple. The clear modern-day equivalent is the church, all right? It's the local church. It's it's not a charity. It's not your kid's Christian school. That's not the tithe. Tithe is what you, you give to ministry. That it may be food in my house so that so the church or the temple can do ministry. Now here it goes. Now, test me in this. Here's God talking some trash. Here's God talking a little divine smack. Test me in this. This is so huge. And see, if you bring the tithe, if I would not throw open the if your translation says windows, you need a different Bible. Because a floodgate's better than a little window. See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much. That, no, it's not sad. It's good news. You, there will not be room enough to contain it. I, so here's, here's the question. Don't answer out loud. Can, can you trust God when God makes a promise? I mean, God makes his promise. If you'll bring the tithe, the 10%. And by the way, I lost somebody right there like, 10%? Do you know how much 10% is? My budget is so stretched right now. 10%. This is a cult. This is a cult. This is a cult by the glades, isn't it? Cult. 
Actually, a more important idea in the Bible when it comes to this idea of generosity is not that God cares about the 10%. God cares about all of it. God cares about not just the first tenth. He cares about all ten tenths. He cares about not 10%, but 100%. Guess what? Here's maybe a more important idea. Psalm 24, verse 1. It's not just the tithe that belongs to God. It's all of it. Uh, read it loudly. Ready? The earth is the Lord's and... Everything. Great reading. Everything. God says, it's not just the 10% of what I've entrusted to you. It's, it's, it's all of it. You're not really an owner. Yeah, I, I know. Your name is on the deed, and your name, your name is on the title, but it's, it's not really yours. Right. If it really belonged to you, you could keep it eternally. But when you die, you check out with nothing. Right. In fact, you can't even keep it in this life, can you? Recessions, financial reversals, 2009. Right. Our 401ks became 201ks, right? <laughs> And, 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 and so the Bible says it's all mine. So here's the big idea. So I, I don't really own anything, but I feel like I own things. It all belongs to God. And I just steward, or better word, I just manage God's stuff. And if I manage God's stuff wisely, these promises say God might give me more of his stuff to manage. But it's his. So if he asks for 10%, I release his stuff. If he says, bring it, oh, it all belongs to you anyways, I'll, I'll bring it. Why did God not say 30% or 40% or I, I have no idea? It's his. He can do what he wants. I just want to trust his promises. Right, right. Now you're thinking, but David, I have all these obligations and all these needs and all these expenditures, my, my budget or my lack of a budget or my, my debt service. All right, listen, okay, I'm not sure how you track your life financially, uh, what kind of system you use, accounting principles. I like an old school pie graph. Remember the old pie graph, that circular graph, and, and you kind of have little wedges showing how much you spend on this or that. And I like that because, of course, the whole pie equals 100%. And we all have different size pies. Some people have very you know, large earning capacities. Other people, man, you got a part-time job after school or an allowance, but we all have 100%. And I like pie because my mom's in the room and no one makes a better pie than my mother. Her pecan pie is a worship experience. It really is, mom. It's, I don't even have a sweet tooth. It is irresistible sin. It is so good. So anyways, pies, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, money, pies, pies, generosity. And so based on Psalm 24, Everything you have, everything you have, investments, resourcing, income, paychecks, blah, 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 all that comes from God. So everything I have comes from the Lord. God brings me the pie. All right, here we go, here we go. So, so Nate's playing God today. Give it up for God. God is here delivering me a pie. Thank you, thank you, Nate. Nate's on our video team. And Nate's doing that because Morgan Freeman was not available today. So he's going to play the part of the Lord above. And based on Psalm 24 and the totality of Scripture, that if you have anything that's worthy in life, it comes from God. All of it. Not just 10%. All of it. So it comes from God. Now, as soon as I get my pie, people start taking pieces, wanting a bite of my pie. Right? Like, house. A house. This is the banker right here. Quincy's our banker right here. And so if, <laughs> so if you have a mortgage or rent, you know, if you have shelter. If you have shelter, by the way, if you're not homeless, you're blessed but it's probably costing you something. And so right away, man, I got, I got to pay for the housing. And, you know, financial consultants say that if you will devote maybe 25% to 33% for housing, uh, that, that's wise. And that's, that's, that's your net. By the way, we live in South Florida. Real estate's expensive. Here we go. Um, and that's not just rent and mortgage. That's insurance. That's upkeep that's utilities but man the man the bank comes looking for their payment They're, i have a mortgage you have a mortgage so they get a, look at my poor pie sit down banker man oh my gosh <laughs> my pie was once upon a time so pretty i could enjoy all my pie that god gave me but people come wanting a piece of my pie all the time but oh wait a minute wait a minute yes i'm excited about that about this one god has blessed me with people who share their lives with me who i have a family in jesus name you know, I met my family, this is my family, and uh, I love to share with them. I have this beautiful wife. Honey, would you like some nice things? Would you like to buy? Oh, of course, dear. I, a lot of nice things. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I love giving to her. Look at this cute little guy right here. He likes video games. There you go, bud. That's for you. And, and his big brother here, Charlie, Charlie loves, Charlie loves, loves sneakers and Victoria. Man, look how good she looks. Clothes for her. Man, oh, yeah. Come here, come here. Oh, yeah, absolutely. My, my pleasure. And, Maybe Victoria wants, uh, oh, wants, wants uh, Ariana Grande tickets, right? Woo! And uh, you can pay for that yourself. All right, so. But I gladly share my pie with my family. They're a blessing. 
Give it up for my family one more time. Oh, yeah. Now, my pie is not so pretty, but I have people. I have a home. I'm blessed. I'm going to enjoy the rest of myself, man. I, oh, I love that's That's so good. Oh. Transportation. Ricky Bobby, how are you here? Oh, man. Shake and bake, right? Here we go. Here we go. Yeah, I had to get new tires the other day. Uh, you know, man, kids are driving out. Oh, insurance rates in South Florida. Oh, my, for teenagers. But, you know, and listen, I love the cars at Church by the Glaze. Some people, man, you, you have some nice cars. I'm not being judgy. I've just seen the parking lot. You got Beamers and Mercedes. I've seen Ferraris in the parking lot, Lamborghinis. I love seeing like a, a Church by the Glaze decal in the back of a beautiful car. Then some of y'all have Jesus junkers, man. You have that 2001 smoke belching Ford Fiesta and the Church by the Glade stickers and holding that car together. I love that too. I love that too. It's awesome. Awesome. Um, by the way, if you have a car, whether it's a nice car or an old car, if you have a car, only 8% of the world's population has a car. That's a blessing. Oh, no. Oh, this one can mess up your pie right here. This one. If you are not smart with credit, credit can mess up your pie. Oh, if you, and if you're disciplined, a credit card's okay. It's not sinful, but if you lack discipline, the average American family who carries a balance on their credit cards over $15,000. Oh, that can, man, mess up your pie in a hurry as credit cards. Oh, that's, and by the way, interest rates can be as high as 22, 22%. That's some, Crazy empty calories of, of debt and debt service right there. Wow, credit cards can mess you up. By the way, Jade, I'm, I'm not get away. You have to talk in my ear here, but they cast Jade from our worship team to do this. And actually, Jade, this is a terrible one for you because you manage your credit well. You and Sam have, uh, we offer something called Financial Peace University. It's a holistic teaching on how you manage your finances. And a lot of people who take it have some debt to deal with. And you and Sam, when you started practicing the financial peace principles, how much did you guys owe? $460,000. Did you hear that? $460,000. Uh, mostly it was, it was like student loans. student loans, but some credit card stuff. Some credit cards. And you guys worked the plan. That's right. And, and you're debt free now. That's correct. So sit down, credit card. I didn't know they were going to have Jade do that, but I had to stop. It's one of the best things we do is offer that. Oh, <laughs> oh man. <laughs> uh, what's your tax bracket? 15%, 25%, what's like 28%? Man, some of y'all like 39.6%. Don't you love paying your taxes? Isn't it a blessing? Isn't it? Yeah, sit down, tax man. Oh my goodness! Better take care of the tax guy. Look at my pie. Look at my pie. My, my pie was so beautiful once upon a time. Oh no! College. Do you have a college kid? Someone going to? Do you have a smart kid like Serena here? A smart kid? Oh, my. college tuition has gone up 37 percent in the last decade. Then there's books and there's housing. Oh my good college. I, I have. Nail appointments? No, that's, that's not. Meal plan. Oh, meal plan, meal plan, yes. And man, it gets so expensive. I barely have anything left. My, my pot. Oh, by the way, she's smart. Bright Futures. Give me some of that. Bright Futures. There you go. Right. College kids, sit down. My once beautiful pie. But I got a little piece for it. Well, a little piece for it. For me. Just a little something for me. Just a little, you know, I, I mean, not too much for me. A little something for me. Come on. A little me time. I love sports. I love, I love, I love fishing. Whoa! I love. Hold on one second, Pastor David. Hughes. Oh, no. No. This yep. is just wrong. Yep. Let me grab that real quick. <laughs> oh, right out of my pie plate, too. Nice. Nice. Listen. You got a beautiful family of five back there behind us, and maybe six one day. So whoa, 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 whoa! No, no, I think we've taken care of that. We're good on that. So oh, that's... AC just went out. Oh, Maybe that happened. Out. AC went out this week. AC guy came, very nice guy. There three hours. That's going to be yep. expensive. There's always something you don't plan for. There's always if you don't have margin. Oh, get out of here, man! Yep. You're killing right, my pie. I'm going to take your sprinkler system. Pretty sure the pump's dead. <laughs> Oh, 
So here, and here's, here's, the, here's the deal. So you're in church. Man, listen, I know y'all. Man, you're a phenomenal people. What an honor to love you and lead you for 20 years. And I, and I know your heart. You guys are you're, you're kingdom people. You love God. You're saved people. And so you hear a message like this, and you see these powerful promises. You're like, I'm in. I want to give. I want to tithe. But we've so mismanaged the pie that all of a sudden you're like, oh, Lord, thank you. I, I want those promises. Lord, I want all that. Lord, please, please. Bless my crumbs, oh, Lord. Bless what I have left over, God. Please take this and favor my life. Sorry about that, Lord. Give it up for my pie panel, if you will. Give it up for my pie panel. Just try to make a point in a way that's tasty. Key lime's always good. Look, I, I, we're giving God leftovers. robbing God. We talk about robbing God, right? <laughs> and, and, and God doesn't promise ever to, to bless leftovers. And, and again, I, I'm not trying to put any pressure. I'm just trying to be logical with you. If he really is a king, if he really is a king, if he really is a king, like if it's just me and the family, we ate leftovers for dinner last night. This is fine. But what if, what if somebody like really powerful came to visit you? What if, you know, go back 20 years, pick out your favorite president. What if he announced, I'm coming to your house tomorrow? Well, what would you do, man? You would clean the house. It'd be spotless. You'd, you'd make everything so nice. You'd give that pep talk to the kids, right? Best manners, no fighting, no burping, no farting, right? President's coming. <laughs> you wouldn't serve leftovers either. You'd prepare the most beautiful banquet you, you could afford because the president is coming to your home. That's just a president. See, here's the logic. Here's why we should be generous and open-handed. He's a great king and deserves our first and our finest. That's why the tithe is not just 10%. It's always the first thing you do. It's always the first thing you take care of. Like my, my family, we give online. We give online because we just set that up. You know, it's the first payment we make or the first bill, what do you want to call it, an act of generosity, and we set that up on a reoccurring. So we just make sure God's taken care of first because he's the king. We want to honor the tithe. And, it, you know, it's been tight sometimes, but God's helped us to pay every single bill over the years. Uh, God's been good to us over the years. And I'm just here telling you that God, in due time, keeps his promises. Um, but that first idea is important because he's a king. In fact, it's taught in the Bible. Let me show you just a couple more promises and I'll cut you loose. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3, starting about verse, verse 8, I think it is, says, this is so neat. Verse 9, honor the Lord with your wealth, comma, with the first fruits. They were agrarian people. So the first of your harvest goes to God. So the first thing, not the last, not whatever you have left in the bushel basket when you've paid all the, the first goes to God. Why? He's a king. It's logical. And the king deserves our first and our finest. So the first goes to him. And then here's a promise again. Then your barns will be filled with overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. And look, I'm not saying you're going to tithe on Sunday and you get the mystery check in the mail on Monday. I just know God keeps a promise. Now, I will tell you this, sometimes the tithe is tested. Sometimes you tithe and nothing changes for a season. Sometimes you tithe and things get tighter or worse before they get better. So it's not about this financial, hey, God, give me, give me, give me. It's just the logic. You are the king. And you give me everything. The Bible says in James, he's the father of lights with whom there's no variation or shifting shadow. And every good and perfect gift comes down from him. So if you got it and it's good, it's from God. Now, if you're feeling pressure right now, or you're feeling bad, or you're angry, listen, don't give anything. Please don't give anything. Please, don't come back. But, but don't, don't feel that kind of pressure, because that's the verse I left out of that first passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to put that on the screen right now. So I, I told you where it said, hey, so generously, and God's able to bless you abundantly in all times, all things. You remember that great promise. But here's a little piece in the middle that I, I, I chose to omit that I now insert again into the conversation. And this is so important. This is about the attitude. So the amount's 10%. The when is it comes first. But it says this, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Meaning if the preacher put pressure on you, if you feel bad or mad, Please, don't give a nickel. 
please, if you're angry, I feel manipulated. Don't, don't give it. That was not my intent. It's not my intent. And I, I don't think God honors that attitude. Conversely, though, look after the comma. For God loves a cheerful giver. He, 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 he wants you to understand that he has been so generous to you, not just giving you the breath in your lungs and the roof of your head, but he gave you his son. That our attitude should be, man, I, 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 I get to release resources into the kingdom. I, I get to support what Jesus is doing in the world. I, this is a privilege. It's, it's not just a duty or responsibility. And listen, I, I get this is different for a lot of us because we're all wired differently. Lisa's naturally generous. Lisa will give you, I mean, me though? No, no, no. I'm, I'm a saver. I'm very conservative. I grew up, my dad, uh, my dad was born in the wake of the Depression. He saved everything. He paid cash for all of his cars. He paid cash for his houses, right, Mom? And so we grew up, man, well, we're taught to save. And so if you're like that, you're frugal. Jesus, Lisa says cheap, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Being generous is hard. Now, now we want to be generous and cheerful. What's it look like? I think it just looks like trusting God and being obedient and, and knowing that you can trust your Heavenly Father. So let me show you an example of this. Your kids reflect you, you know. Uh, Victoria is more like her mom. She's naturally generous. Uh, she's not a saver. When she's a little kid, she got money, man. She goes spend it or give it away right away. Charlie, my oldest, is like me. Man, he saved every nickel he got. So Charlie's like six or seven. And uh, his birthday is in early March. So it's like Christmas, boom, all these checks from Grandma and in March, you know, more money from aunts and uncles and stuff. And so he had like, he saves it all. He had $174 saved. That's a lot of money. And Lisa said, hey, hey, this might be a great time to teach him about tithing. To which I responded, no, this is a terrible time. This is going to break his heart. We should have taught him back when he had $1, right? Change it to 10 dimes. But this is going to hurt. This is $17.40. He's going to think it's a massive amount. So he sat down, had the talk with me. Hey, buddy, we love you. And, you know, God's been so good to you. And there's this thing in the Bible called tithing. And you just got blessed with all this money for Christmas. And, and you know, tithing's giving God 10% right away. I mean, he's like, how much is 10%? Well, that's $17.40. He's like, you're going to make me give to God $17. You're going to make me do this tithe thing. No, no, no. We're going to make you do anything. I just think you should pray about it. God's been very good to you. And he makes promises. And you just do what God lays in your heart. I watched that poor kid wrestle for three days. I felt so bad. I wanted to give him the money to give, but you can't do that, right? And, and so finally, it was in the old building. Finally, he said, Daddy, I want to do my tithe. I'm going to do my tithe. And someone had the presence of mind to grab a video camera. He gave one of the offering boxes. And because I knew this was something he had a hard time being cheerful about, uh, I got some of the staff around to cheer for him and celebrate him as he gave. So just check this out. This is Charlie back when he's like seven, giving for the first time. Charlie's doing something very big today. This is Charlie's first time ever to give God a tithe. And tithe is 10% what we believe in our family. And you're trusting God to bless you? Are you glad to do this? You are? All right. Whenever you're ready, buddy. Do work. Wait, wait, wait. He's crying right now. He's crying right now. <laughs> okay, you may think he was crying because he had to give the tithe and gave up the $17. But I, I thought, oh my gosh, I was trying to, you know, cheer him on and encourage him. I thought, I, I embarrassed him. I embarrassed him. There's too many people in the room. And, and so I, I grabbed him quickly right after the video was done. And I ran to the auditorium and the back row was empty. and said, buddy, I'm so sorry if I embarrassed you. That was not what I wanted. And he, he's there crying. He goes, no, no, dad. Dad, you embarrassed me. It just, it just felt really good to give my tithes to God. Wait, wait, wait. And then he said, but that was so stressful. I'm never tithing again. <laughs> There, there's no recession in heaven. God's not, oh my gosh, they, if they don't tithe, we're in trouble up here, folks. We're going to have cutbacks in heaven if they don't, they don't. No, this, this is about raising his kids. It's about, you know, a very tangible way to grow your faith and see, do you, do you trust him? Is it just lip service and words? Is there something real in your life? And so that's, that's the truth. It's on you and God now. But do what God lays on your heart. But know this, you can trust the promises of God. And there's someone here, you've never given your heart to Christ. What a brilliant day to do that. I love when that happens. I'll teach on tithing and someone gets saved. That's the Holy Spirit, right? I'm talking about your money and God's talking about your heart and your life and you give your heart to Christ. 
Uh, do what God calls you to do. Invite everyone you know to the Stephen Furtick weekend. It's going to blow your mind. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. We've tried to have some fun with what can be an awkward conversation. But actually, nothing you call us to do, nothing you speak into in our lives should ever feel strange or inappropriate. For God, you have the prerogative and the power. You are the great king to speak into any arena of our lives. And as a great king, you always deserve our first and our finest. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week.